Good morning and welcome. Why don't we all stand, please? Everybody standing. Merry Christmas to you and your family. We're kind of into that zone. Appreciate that, of course. It's a wonderful time of the year. Let's sing number 542, if you would, please. 542. When we all get to heaven, first or second, and the last verse, sing with me. What did that be? Number 542. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim path, we found Just 
through 12. James chapter 5. Go to now you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are mocked. Your gold and silver is canker, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last day. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cry, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord as that. You have lived in pleasure on the earth, you have been wanton, you have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receiveth the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth not. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the Lord. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. For above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, for let your nay be yea, and your nay nay, lest you fall in condemnation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you this morning for each and every one that uh, made the effort to come out this morning to hear your word and your worship. We pray you bless the uh, music this morning, the singing, and the message, and our worship this morning. We ask that you bless all these things in your precious name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Let's turn to number 338, please. 338. Ask Calvin. You're going to spend a minute in the prime. Calvin, it's in the first, the third, and the last. Three, three, eight. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. i 
chapter 6, please. Galatians chapter 6. I think you heard Drew there at least. So we will work on training them all to kind of rally around those microphones. If you want to stand with me, that would be great. We're going to read to our, our responsive scripture reading at this time in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 this morning. We'll read from verses 7 down through the end of the epistle, verse 18. As we only do, I'll read these verses responsibly. If you would please just join me on verse uh, 8 and every other verse throughout the passage. I'll read verse 7 and you read with me verse 8 and so on every other verse. Galatians 6 and verse number 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And uh, for our subject this morning, we're going to talk about patience. Let's decide to have patience. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for our, uh, our text here that teaches us so many different things about just only having our glory in the cross of Christ. We talk about that many times for a long time. We can talk about Paul and his you know, just understanding of the law and how circumcision or, or uncircumcision really availeth nothing. It's just a new creature, the fact that we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that is something that we should be praising God for, be thankful for uh, throughout our days. And Lord, I pray that you bless this morning. Help us to have understanding in this truth. Help us to be patient people. Help us to trust you and have faith in you and be patient in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Patience is our subject this morning, and it's cliche, patience is a virtue. Of course, we've all heard that phrase. What that means is that patience simply is a good thing, okay? If you have two different people who are equal in all other ways, they have the same basic character level, and they have uh, the same basic self-discipline, or just all of their virtues, so, so to speak, would add up very similarly, but one has quite a bit more patience than the other, well, the person who has more patience is the better person. We should strive to be increasing and growing in patience. We should try to have more of it than we had last year, right? So what is patience? And this is important. I think some people are at least a bit misguided in their understanding of what patience uh, can be or how it can materialize in your life. Here's the best I can do at demonstrating what patience is versus what patience is not. Picture a teacher, a, a teacher who teaches reading. So when we're talking about really, really young uh, students here, we're talking about first grade, second grade, third grade, they're learning to read, okay? Has anybody ever done, you know, some teaching of reading to that kind of age group? Anybody in here? A, a few of you, okay? It takes patience, and I'm sure those folks could testify to that. But here's what I want you to understand. Patience is not when that teacher you know, looks at the difficulty of what that is, teaching that young person to read and just saying, boy, this is hard. Well, que sera, sera, you know, if they don't get proficient in reading until they're about 17, that's fine. You know, I, I just need to be patient. Just, just let them fall behind, whatever. That's really just a form of complacency and neglect and possibly some laziness. 
What patience is for that teacher who teaches reading is saying, look, I don't care how often I have to go over this again. You know, this is the L sound. Okay, this, this is how you pronounce that sight word. This is how the blend is supposed to be pronounced. This one is sh, this one is ch, this one is th, and this one is voice, it's th, right? That's, that, that's how you pronounce these words. This right here is pronounced there. Let's go over the phonics again, and no matter how many times they have to repeat themselves, no matter how often they feel like they're just banging their head up against a stone wall, the patient teacher keeps on teaching, okay? The teacher, it decides I'm going to be diligent, I'm going to stay with it, and I'm going to not give up. They, they have hardships, they have setbacks. It seems unlikely that this child is ever going to get it, but they keep on believing. They keep on trusting that curriculum. They keep on going into all the detail and all of the routine and just working with that child. That is patience, okay? In verse 9 we read a while ago, the Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing in Galatians chapter 6. That's patience. Patience is not settling for second best and just saying, oh, well, you know, maybe it'll take me years to become a good prayer warrior. Maybe it'll take me years to be a good, uh, you know, person in the church who actually helps other people and actually contributes and does things around the church and helps with things. You know, maybe it'll take me years and years and years to become a witness for Christ. And you know what? That's okay. No, patience is putting your best foot forward. And, you know, we talk about soul winning. Put your best foot forward and patience is learning from somebody, you know, some of the good things to say, applying yourself, working hard, memorizing the verses. And then when you get out there and maybe you don't do as well as you hope, you don't quit. You keep on working on what to say. You keep on practicing and, and memorizing again and the verses and, and going over the material again. Patience is that thing that says within you, you know what? I know this is going to take weeks or months of effort and hard work, but I don't care. I want badly enough to be a good soul winner. I want badly enough to be a prayer warrior. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to work hard. And I'm going to earn it. The harder the conflict, the more joyous the triumph. And you keep right on improving and improving until one day you're a consistent soul winner. Then finally, one day, you're a consistent prayer warrior. But what I'm saying is that patience is not complacency. Patience is not being okay with failure or being okay with a lack of obedience to the commands of God for decades and decades until finally, you know, things just sort of click on their own. That's not patience. That's complacency. Patience says, you know what? I know it takes a long time for a child who can't read to, to catch all of those sight words. I know it takes them a long time to learn the letters, learn the phonics, and learn things wrong first, you know, and slowly correct it, but I'm not going to let that fact get me discouraged. I'm not going to make any excuses. I'm not going to slow down. This kid's going to get it, or I'm going to tr die trying to help him get it. Patience is not being weary in well-doing. Now, this understanding of patience may be somewhat of an opinion, but in support of that opinion, consider James 5, 7, which we read a few moments ago, uh, with Brother Dave, toward the beginning of the service. He said, the verse says, patient, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Now, tell me, what you, from what you know about farming, does a good farmer say, you know what, I'm just going to wait for rain today. I'm going to do nothing while I wait. I'm just going to sit here. Eventually, it's going to have to rain, right? Is that good for a farmer? You know, does a, does, a farmer, does a good farmer say, you know what, I might have to wait for just years and years of unproductiveness and leanness until I finally have a little bit of fruit in maybe the eighth or tenth year or something like that. That is not a good farmer. Obviously, he has to get out there. He has to plant on the days when there's not going to be any rain. He has to do a lot of work in lieu of rain, trusting that the rain will eventually come. It takes a lot of work. And that's the example in the Word of God of patience. So a Christian who is patient unto the coming of the Lord is one who is obedient and works hard and puts forth effort to serve the Lord while he does not get impatient for his rewards or for the Lord's return. Jesus will come in his perfect time. Let's be patient. Let's not be weary in well-doing. If you want to flip over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. There's another similar word we'll mention this morning, and that word is forbearance. Now, this word forbearance is, it's, is kind of something like doing nothing. That is doing nothing in response or doing nothing in retaliation to others who may be attacking you in some way or who are bothering you or are a problem or a pain to you. While you're turning there, we'll just read a few other verses here in the Word of God about forbearance um, so you can kind of get a good feel for its meaning. 
Proverbs 25, 7, uh, Proverbs 25, 15 says, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, I love this verse. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Ephesians 4, 2 says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Ephesians, 5, uh, Ephesians 6, 9 says, And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respected persons with him. Now you're there in Colossians 3, look at verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So to me, from these verses, it would seem forbearing is basically doing nothing or it's an emphasis of something that you're not going to do. In Ephesians 6, 9, it says forbearing, threatening. So we're not going to threaten, right? It would seem reasonable, right, to threaten somebody in that situation. But we're not going to threaten. We're going to forbear and threaten. So forbearance is simply when others mistreat you or attack you or bother you. You don't react. You don't retaliate. You don't try to punish them. You don't get all upset. You essentially just ignore their attack and just go on to go on doing what's right. You go on in a way that you know is pleasing to the Lord. And two of these verses tell us to forbear one another. So forbearance is important in marriage. That would be a good example. Marriage cannot work when both parties have to win the argument. Marriage can't work when you both have to be right. So when your spouse says something that can create an argument, you just have to learn to say something kind or nice and move on or just say nothing at all. Remember, the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. The desire to defend yourself comes because of pride. But the desire to just love your spouse and just meet their needs and just help them have a good day then, today, that comes from unselfishness and love. And love is the fruit of the Spirit. Swallow your pride and love your spouse. Amen? Long-suffering and endurance are similar attributes. I came across this recently. It was, it's a young man who said he was praying. And he said, I prayed to God, and I said, God... Uh, what is a million? What, what is a hundred million dollars to you? And he's asked like a penny to me, son. And he said, God, what's a million years like to you? And the man, and God said, that's about like a, a second to me, son. And the man thought for a moment. He said, God, can I have a penny? And God said, just a second, son. Just wait a million years, and we'll take care of you there. So what we're going to do this morning is just look at some examples, some good examples and some bad examples of patience and impatience so that we can get a biblical picture of what patience is. We'll start in Genesis chapter 15, if you would please, Genesis chapter 15. One of the overarching truths that we'll look at today is the idea that in the early part of life, we are to be learning. We learn, we study, we get smart, we gain wisdom, hopefully we, we gather some skills, we, we try to uh, develop some skills. We take the long look in life and we try not to allow impatience in some area cause us to forfeit a blessing in the future. And as we look at some of the bad examples, hopefully you'll be able to see that truth reading out. In Genesis 12, look at verse number 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son. And all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land into, unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Amorah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thee, unto thy seed, will I give this land. So, here God promises to give Abram seed of his own. Now, that would have been a bit of a tough promise for Abram and his wife to believe since he and his wife have been trying to have children for decades, probably 40 years or more, and they haven't been able to have any children. But here Abraham is 75 years old. He's going to live to be 175, okay? So they're still aging a bit more slowly than we do today. But I'm just trying to emphasize for you this promise, the promise that Abraham will have seed of his own body. If you would please flip over to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 now. So now quickly, I'm just going to sum up for you how was Abraham when he finally had that child of promise? He was 100 years old, right, when he had Isaac. So this promise takes at least 25 years to be fulfilled from the first time that Abram had received this promise. In fact, Abram became a bit of a bad example of impatience as he hearkened to his wife around the age of 87. 
and he takes Hagar to be his wife, and they bring forth Ishmael. And so God, then he has to say, well, okay, I have heard you concerning Ishmael. I'll make him a great nation for your sake. But look, I'm not going to get derailed from my main purpose. With Isaac will I establish my covenant, and at this set time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. The promise stays sure, even though there was some impatience in the life of Abraham. And as we get the full picture of the life of Abraham and the timelines of his descendants and Genesis and everything, Isaac was born right on time, my friend. God came through right on time in keeping his promise to Abraham. Look there in Exodus chapter 12, and look all the way down to verse number 40. Exodus 12, verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Now I showed once before that there are some other ancient texts that have here Egypt and Canaan, which I think works better. I did a study on that on a Sunday night once and covered it all. I won't go back into it. But look at verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years... Even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So what I think this is saying is that from the day Abraham came into Canaan, that first day that he left Mesopotamian territory or Chaldean territory and he was in Haran, from that day that he stepped over into Canaan and God came to him and said, look, I've done seed while I give this land, this land of Canaan that you're now in. From that day to the day that the children of Israel walked out of Egypt, was 430 years to the day. Think about the planning of God. God's plan was perfect. But you also have to think about something else as far as delivering the children out of bondage, the children of Israel out of bondage. God was right on time, but it really wouldn't have seemed like that to them. Remember the story when the children of Israel, you know, they were bond they're in bondage in Egypt and Moses is the deliverer and he first comes. Remember how Moses first got there, things got worse? They didn't provide any straw anymore. The workload got heavier, got harder. And then, of course, all the plagues had to come. So, you know, the first one, for example, lasted seven days, the turning of the river into blood. The frogs, that was at least a day, I think. There were several other plagues. Then the darkness, remember, it was three days. Okay, so add all of this up in your mind. And, of course, there's setbacks in there, you know, arguing with Pharaoh. And it's just kind of pulling teeth with him, and it's frustrating. But again, with the benefit of hindsight, what do we see? God came through, not one minute early. God came through. He had it all set up to deliver them right on time. And you know, isn't that the case all throughout the scriptures? When we saw the three Hebrew children about to be thrown into the burning fiery furnace, God didn't show up 10 seconds late, but they would all have perished. He was there right on time. Right before the crossing of the Red Sea, we had Pharaoh's army. He's coming through the gap in the mountains, and these are bloodthirsty people. And right on time, the angel of the Lord comes, and he throws up a fiery pillar, and he stops them dead in their tracks. And that fiery pillar lasted for probably six or eight or ten hours. And then right on time, that fiery pillar was taken away, perfect for getting that bloodthirsty army right in the midst of the sea, that they might all perish. God was right on time with all of that, and he had a perfect plan. When Daniel was thrown into the den of lions, again, God was not 10 seconds late. He was right on time. Because, you know, later we saw what happened, if you read the scripture, what happened to the other men that were thrown into that den of lions. God was not supernaturally protecting those people. What happened to them? They were torn asunder of the beast before they ever came to the bottom of the den, the Bible says. So listen, if, they, if, if God had been 10 seconds late for Daniel, Daniel would have perished. But he wasn't late. He was right on time. God was right on time filling the ditches with water in 1 Kings chapter 3. He was right on time shutting the door of the ark in Genesis chapter 7. God was right on time. The seventh time that Naaman the Syrian washed in the Jordan River, on that very time God healed him of his leprosy. God was right on time causing the sun to stand still for Joshua and his battle. God was right on time for Gideon causing 300 men to put an innumerable multitude of soldiers to flight. God was twice right on time for David whose cause was just to Spare the life of Saul, who had been hunting him. God's been in time and on time every time. And you know what? Galatians 4 gives us the best time in history in which he was right on time. It says that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. Right when the world most needed a savior, right when the world most needed peace on earth, right when the world most needed a uh, good news unto all people, that's when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life right when we needed it most. That's the same God who gives us his promises in the word of God, such as our text. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Why? For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we have patience, if we keep on working, if we keep on laboring like we ought to, like the word of God tells us that we should, if we, if we do that, we shall reap, the Bible says. If there's something that we sowed, 
with hard work. So Abraham is a good example of how important patience is. 25 years for a promise to be fulfilled. And I would say without doubt, Abraham would have shared that story with Isaac. That would make sense to me. Now, Isaac's going to have to have some kids as well, or the whole thing was meaningless, right? So that's part of the promise of God. Yet Isaac and Rebecca get married. Do you remember what happened? They go for 19 years, no children. Again, they're trying. They're attempting to have children. Rebecca appears to be barren. Finally, at some point, Isaac began to plead with the Lord. He began to pray and just beg God that God would give them children. And once they've been married for 20 years, finally, Esau and Jacob come into their lives. 25 years probably for Abraham to receive the promise. 20 years for Isaac being married, knowing the Lord has promised children before he receives his portion of the promise. Patience. Think about the life of Jacob. If my math is correct, he just sits and waits, doesn't get married until he's 56 years old. At that age, he finds a girl that he's just head over heels in love with. And what does he say to her father? You know what? I'll serve you seven years for her. I'll wait for seven years before I take her. I'll earn her properly. And I think that's the idea that might be the contrast, you know, with between him and his brother, Esau. In the New Testament, it talks about him being a profane person. Because he's, you know, in the same story, he's there at the age of 40, he's already taken two wives. Neither of them are believers, as far as we know. And then he observes that his parents prefer descendants of Abraham or of his family for them to take wives from. And so he goes and just, you know what, I'm just going to take one of the daughters of Ishmael to wife. And it kind of sounds like, you know what, tomorrow I'll just go and take, my, take another wife. Contrast to Jacob, who says, you know what, I found the one I want. I'll take seven years and earn her property. We're given the bad example of impatience in the life of Esau when he sold his birthright. Now, Esau might have told himself that for all he knows, this is not really going to make any difference for decades, right? It doesn't make a difference until daddy kicks the bucket. Then, you know, there's a significant financial advantage. And then I get to be a leader in the family and have some privileges and responsibilities. But folks, that's not for decades and decades. Right now, I'm extremely hungry. Right now, my appetites need to be fulfilled, don't they? And of course, what he should have done was just had the patience to go make some pancakes or warm up some leftovers, right? Or just, who knows, go walk to the people next door, offer them some cash, maybe offer Jacob some cash or some reduced price, something less than his birthright. And nobody's saying he just should have gone on some kind of three-day fast or something. But the bad example is there to show us what happens in the next chapter. His short-sightedness and his impatience cost him far more. Than he realized it would cost. And he's left with this great and bitter cry. No, please. And just saying, please, Father, do, do you have any other blessing? Do you only have one blessing? Really? That doesn't make any sense to me. God, uh, uh, Father, please bless me too. And the Bible talks about how he's weeping. And he finds no place of repentance, though he seeks it carefully with tears. It cost him a whole lot more than he thought that he was selling. And there's no undoing his impatience. And his short-sightedness. So that's what we need this morning. We need to understand that patience is that important. I was referring to earlier about the fact that we need to observe and take heed to those examples where in the Bible somebody was impatient and they blew the opportunity that they would have had later on, or they forfeited some other great blessing or privilege later on because they had short-sightedness. If we have patience, decades later we reap the benefits. But if we're short-sighted and don't have patience, we forfeit those blessings and those benefits. And yes, it's decades later, but we need to have the character to understand that we need to obey God. Let's decide we're going to have patience. Flip over to Luke chapter 15, if you would please. Luke chapter 15. Let's just continue summing up here in the book of Genesis. Of course, we got the life of Joseph while you're turning there. Abraham, we said, set 25 years of waiting. Isaac, before he got the, the, the promise. Uh, Isaac, 20 years. Jacob, seven years to marry the woman he loved, then seven more years because of getting a bit slickered and whatnot. But he had the patience to endure through that. And probably something like 26 more years of earning and building wealth, building a plantation of his own that could sustain the large family that he was building, which God was giving him. And then, of course, we come to Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old, and he was sold into slavery. Then he wound up in prison for a crime which he did not commit. And finally, at the age of 30, 13 years later, He's promoted to second in command in all of Egypt, and he reaps the benefits of the patience that he had. Because, like I think I mentioned last week, in those 13 years of slavery in prison, he could have given up on God and said, you know what, I'm done trying to please God, trying to serve God, trying to look around for others whom I can please, look around for others whom I can make be a benefit to their family. No, sir, I see where that's got me, and I'm just going to look out for number one now, and I'm just going to molt and, and, you know, just give up on God. And what would have happened? Probably God would never have 
you know, allowed Pharaoh to find out about his gift and his wisdom and all of his expertise. Who knows? He may have been in prison for the rest of his life if he had been short-sighted and had given up on the faith in God. But instead, he stayed faithful, he had great patience, and his latter end was blessed. Look at Luke chapter 15. This is, of course, the story of the prodigal son, starting in verse number 11. The prodigal son is a bad example of patience. Verse number 11 says, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now, I think we all know this isn't the way it's supposed to work. The last will and testament of any wealthy person is of no effect while the testator liveth, right? That's what it says in Hebrews. But here, Jesus is representing the fact, this is, a, this is a proverb, it's a parable, right? It didn't really happen. It's a story to help you understand truth. Jesus is representing the fact that God the Father gives his children a lot of freedom and a lot of choices. If you want, you can forfeit his blessings and of, you know, the promises that he promises you for the life of self-discipline and the good priorities and the hard work and the effort and the patience. You can forfeit those things with poor priorities and a lack of patience and a lack of worth ethic and short-sightedness. And that's one thing that this younger son represents, somebody who doesn't want to earn things the right way and winds up forfeiting something very, very valuable. So he divides unto them his living. And verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So as this picture unfolds that Jesus is drawing for us, it's a young person who is short-sighted. Of course, he does not make some good investments with these funds. He doesn't buy a house he doesn't study and find a commodity or a business partnership or some other way to invest his money that it might hold its value. No, he just goes and he just blows it. He just buys whatever pleasure he wants, toys and games and probably female company, maybe wine and strong drink, but he just goes on a complete restraint-free spending spree. And before long, it's all gone. And remember, it's, again, it's not a real story. This is a proverb. And this part of the parable is a warning to people who don't want to have the discipline and don't want to have the patience when they're early in life. Just, you know, stay at home, learn a craft, learn some skills while your parents are taking care of you. Develop some skills. Yes, it might take four to 12 years to learn certain skills that are actually in demand. So this story is about a young person who got impatient with that process of four years, six years, eight years, 12 years of learning a skill and getting ready. You know, and, and going into the 30-year process or so of working hard all your life, earning a place in society where you can care for yourself, pay your own way, and you, he just winds up spending his future for a very short period of empty pleasures. Look at verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Remember, again, this is a parable. This famine hits to show us would have been much wiser for this young man to learn a skill, to develop a trade, to invest in a house, to get prepared, because you don't know when a time of leanness is going to come. You don't know when hard times might be just around the corner. And since he didn't really learn a skill or make any investments at all, he begins to be in one. He winds up with a total bottom uh, of the barrel type of a job uh, that doesn't require any skills. Verse 15, and he went and joined himself to a certain, to a citizen of that country. He sent him into the, his fields to feed swine, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. So Jesus just painting this very pitiful, very sad picture of a young person who does not prepare for his future and is short-sighted. He's extremely hungry. Pig slop is starting to look good. He has nothing. He's in extreme poverty. Now, most of the time, we just sort of allow this story to come to its happy ending, and we kind of emphasize that. Today, I, when we're talking about patience. I want to emphasize for you the part of the story that represents the permanent damage, the part of the story to which there's no silver line, the part of the story there's not really a good happy ending here, a feel-good ending, okay? You're all familiar with the story, of course. He does re repent. He does change his mind when no man gave him to him. He goes home. He reconciles with his father. And, of course, the father is so happy to have him home that he kills the fatted calf. They start making merry. They have this big party. They invite all their friends. They celebrate his coming home safe and sound, and they're happy. But look at verse number 31. This is the second to last verse in the chapter, verse number 31. And he said unto him, this is the father talking to the older son and entreating him. And he said unto him, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And what this reminds us here is, essentially, that first young man, the prodigal son, was a part owner. 
with his father's business and with his father's plantation. He was a shareholder, if you will, of all that his father owned. But he squandered that on frivolousness and riotousness. And now he's just like a servant. And he's always going to be just the employee, just under his father and later just under his brother. His birth afforded him a shareholdership of sorts. But he has lost that. Folks, we need to make sure that we are not short-sighted. Have patience. Look over if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We all know Jesus is coming again, but no man knoweth the day or the hour. So listen, the fact that Jesus is coming again should never make us complacent or neglectful. It's supposed to motivate us since we know that he will return someday. We know that those who work hard and serve him faithfully will be rewarded. We also know the opposite, that those who do little for Christ, those who are complacent, those who neglect, will suffer loss, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3. Let's not be weary in well-doing and suffer loss. Let us keep on going until we receive the prize. Patience. 1 Corinthians 9, just to catch the context here, we'll start reading in verse 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19, for though I be free from all men, and yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into, into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul likens the Christian life to a race. He says it's sort of like a marathon. The author of Hebrews later in chapter 12, he makes a similar comparison that we should look, look, hey, lay aside every weight and all of the sin and run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, what do you do in a marathon? Well, of course, the goal is to go out and leave it all on the field, so to speak, and to do your absolute utmost to be the best you can be in representing, you know, the team, the, the country, or whatever that you represent. But in order to do that, you have to pace yourself. So there's a balance, okay? Somebody who's short-sighted in a marathon might break from the starting line, and, you know, he's going to get a bit of a lead, but what's going to happen down the stretch? He's going to fizzle, isn't he? He's not going to be able to keep on going. But think about this. Does that mean that the smart runners, they all start lying down? Does that mean that the smart runners just really slowly walk? Of course not. They start giving it their all from the first minute. And so that is a great example of the Christian life. Yes, you got to pace yourself. Yes, you have to be patient with yourself. Yes, you have to learn things and learn skills. But you also go all out to please your Savior. Patience. Don't be short-sighted. We'll start closing with this. I think this is part of the problem with the modern church movement. You know, the, the, the philosophy of, hey, we just need to adopt the world's music and just bring in all the world's standards. We need to shorten the preaching. Make the preaching all nice and soft and, and just soften our stance. Of course, change our names. Change the Bible versions that we use. Why, why would we do all of that? I think there's a few reasons, but one of them might be we want a little bit of a shortcut. They want to attract the crowd. They, they want to be a good, typical amount of people in their church without it taking years and years of labor and hard work and faithfulness. And they allow that thought to convince them that just the hard work and the standards and the faithfulness and, of course, just preaching the truth, preaching the gospel to everybody, well, it doesn't work anymore. And that's what they'll tell you. Hey, look, just go in and preach the gospel to people and being faithful and having patience and working hard, it doesn't work anymore. Let me tell you something. Yes, it does. The gospel still works. Listen, there are people who don't work. Amen? There are people who try to build churches and they don't work that much. Okay? But the gospel works. And if we are faithful and diligent and true to the word of God, and if we preach the gospel, we do things God's way, Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We just have to do the work patience. 
It takes years and years. That's what it took in the book of Acts. That's what it took for Jesus and the apostles. It was three, three and a half years for Jesus and the apostles. That's what it took in the pastoral epistles when Paul is talking to Timothy and talking to Titus. Hey, guys, I need you to stay put. I need you to stay faithful. I need you to stay strong. I need you to preach strong, right? Because it didn't take three weeks and just all of a sudden Timothy's running 4,500 in Sunday school, okay? It took a long time. It took hard work. Every single example in the Bible is the same way takes years and it takes patience but what did our text say let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not as a promise from god so let's decide to have patience in every different area in our lives let's not be short-sighted let's be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the lord heavenly father we love you this morning we thank you so much for these promises in your word yes these examples show us that there's going to be a long period sometimes where we just have to endure. We just got to get up every morning, read our Bible. We just got to get up every morning and pray and keep faithful to our prayer time. We got to go every week and find a way to be preaching the gospel to people. But then over the course of decades, years and decades, the blessings of God are there for those who are faithful. Lord, help us to remember, number one, that you're always on time, that your promises are always secure, that every single time, if we just be patient with you, that the deliverance and the miracle will always come right when we need it most. We believe that, Lord. But number two, help us to just be patient and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stay with me, please? I'm going to turn over to number 366. 366. It's time for our invitation, so I'm going to uh, sing the first verse and the last verse. If you want to sing with me, great. If you want to come, that'd be great. Number 366. I got a piano player. Hold that thought. <laughs> 366. Patience in your life. Is there some area in your life where God would like for you to have patience? Sing that with me. 366. Then Tuesday night at 6 p.m., our ladies have our, uh, their monthly fellowship. Um, so 6 p.m. Tuesday night, then December the 9th, that's Friday night, we have volleyball, food, and fellowship at 5.30 p.m. And then next week, um, the 11th, the children's uh, 
uh, Christmas program, they're having their dress rehearsal. So just so all the parents and everybody else knows, that's right after the service, um, right here, they're gonna be doing their dress rehearsal on the 11th. Uh, on the 13th, we have the Prime Timers Lunch over December at noon in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, on December the 17th, Christmas Caroling, 10 a.m. And then December the 18th is the day of Sunday morning, we're going to be having our children's program, so that'll be part of the main service. We'll just have, we'll have preaching. That's the main part of the service. Every service is preaching, but we'll also have the children's uh, Christmas program on the 18th right here. It's a great time to invite friends, a great time to invite people, especially their relatives, right? If it's their grandparents, if it's, you know, cousins or somebody, hey, so-and-so's in the Christmas play. Don't you want to come and see the Christmas play? It'll be a great time to invite folks out. All right, that morning, after the service, we're going to be having a meal. If you want to talk to my wife about what you could do to help out with that meal, that'd be great. There'll be a devotion to follow in the p.m. service on the 18th and December 25th as well. We'll have a candlelight service at 10.30 a.m. So there's no Sunday school that morning. Give you a little extra time with your family. But 10.30 a.m., we're having our normal service Christmas Day, December the 25th. There'll be no Sunday evening service that day as well. All right, let's stand. It's an exciting month. I, I, I've said it several times. I, I know I like going through the mall or going through, a, you know, it's normally a place where we just hear the degradation music. You know, it's just like, I can't believe they're playing that seriously. But Christmas time, Josh Groban or somebody is up there saying, hey, Christ is the Lord, and, you know, and worshiping Jesus Christ, at least in some, in some form of song. And uh, I relish it. And so it's a great opportunity this month to talk to people about the Lord. Hey, Jesus Christ, you know he's the reason for the season. Do you know Jesus? Hey, are you a Christian? Hey, you know, have you ever taken a Bible show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not easy any time of the year. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's a good time where there's, there's, there's props, you know, there's reminders all around, and uh, it's a good time of the year to do it. Every time of the year is a good time to do it, but I enjoy specifically this time of year is a good reminder for it and a good opportunity for it. Brother Perry, why don't you pray? And then we dismiss. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Dear Lord, our heavenly gracious Father, Lord, we live in a fast-paced world, a fast-food world, a high-want-it-now world. Lord, and according to your word, Lord, we need to have patience about the things that you lead us in, the promises that you have. So often, Lord, we try to take things into our own hands, get ahead of you, Lord, and your promises things that we want in our life, Lord, and it just leads to trouble and, and problems. And Lord, help us to be patient. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to always look to you for these things, Lord, that, that will help us to become more like you and be patient for you to give us the things that you would have for us to do that, Lord. And I just pray that you would help us to be 